What's going on everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we have a totally different type of video and I just wanted to give a quick intro to it and also to just shout out the creator and host of this great podcast, The Green Side. It's a really great episode. It has tons of insight on the field of landscape architecture, what the professional practice is like, and just kind of the general life and upbringing that you have as a designer. So it'll be a really great listen for anyone interested in this field and you'll also get to learn a little bit more about my background and why it is that I have this channel and why I love doing it so much. So if you like landscape architecture and you want to learn more about the field and you just want to hear some different voices, some different perspectives on landscape architecture and what other people are doing in the space, I highly recommend listening to the podcast wherever you like to listen to it. And if you're like me and you like to watch it in video form and you like to put a name to the conversations that are happening, be sure to check out the new YouTube channel that they have. It just started and all of the future podcasts are going to be there as well as to their other usual locations, but these will have the video format you're looking for. Anyways, enjoy the video and I'll see you all in the next one. Welcome listeners to another episode of the Greenside Podcast where we dive deep into the world of landscape architecture and explore the creative minds shaping our outdoor spaces. I'm your host, Graciela Martin, and today we have a remarkable guest joining us, someone who's breaking barriers and changing the landscape of landscape architecture, quite literally. Let me introduce you to Carter, a talented landscape architect by day and creative force behind the YouTube channel Design at Green. But wait, before you assume that's his given name, let's clear the air. Carter is the name he goes by, although he might as well be called Design at Green because of the incredible work he's doing in the field. In this episode, we're peeling back the layers and getting to know Carter, the passionate advocate for making landscape architecture accessible to everyone. In the midst of the COVID pandemic, during his senior year of school, Carter embarked on a creative journey. He started Design at Green as a way to break the mold, to shatter the gates that kept knowledge hidden, and to share the beauty and intricacies of landscape architecture with the world. Throughout our conversation, we'll explore Carter's motivations, the challenges he faced, and the impact he's making in the industry. We'll discuss the importance of dismantling barriers, sharing knowledge, and celebrating the unique fusion of art and science that is landscape architecture. So buckle up and get ready to be inspired as we delve into the story of Carter, the landscape architect turned content creator and the journey that's transforming how we perceive the world outside our windows. One last thing before we start our episode. Shout out to Daniel Sagaon for being the first person to guess who the next guest was. Now, let's get right on to the episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Greenside Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, and his name is Design It Green, right? That's your name? That's your, yeah. that's your given name <laughs> in the hospital? They gave it, they gave that name? <laughs> I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. My name is Carter, not Design and Green. Um, <laughs> I am a by day landscape architect. And then as most of you all probably know, I have a content creation channel called Design and Green, where we kind of explore the world of landscape architecture and help teach and do all those things for new students, current students, or anyone interested uh, in the field of landscape architecture. So cool. I love the work that you do and the and the YouTube videos that you create. They're really, really well made. And I think a lot of a lot of other people too are just like, man, this dude's creating content like content, <laughs> right. And it's like good content too. So we're gonna talk today a little bit about just who you are, because like I said before, I think it's just so easy to start in this landscape design industry or just to talk about the industry itself and be like, so this is landscape architecture. And we all trying to define what it is, which I think is so good to do, right? To like have our right. own definition of it, but which which is definitely going to be a question I'm going to ask you too. <laughs> but just kind of like breaking the mold, you know, of like, okay, you know, what are you doing for the industry? How are you kind of changing the conversation and with your content? The same with my audience is the students, you know, trying to reach the student audience. Right. So what made you want to do landscape architecture geared videos? At all. I think there's a couple reasons why I wanted to start the channel. I think one of the main things, just to give like a background, it was the middle of COVID for me. So it was my senior year of school when I decided to start it. And it was kind of a creative outlet, something that kind of filled time at the time and was something that was very much for fun. But the goal of it, I think, 
was going throughout school, a lot of times, a lot of things in the kind of learning process that we find can be a little bit gatekept, I found. Mm. So my school in particular, very competitive. So say you learned something you wouldn't tell anybody about how you did that. And I think it really kind of created like this kind of barrier between learning landscape architecture and just trying to be better at the field. So I think one of the first things I wanted to do by making the channel is kind of just peel it back of show everyone that everyone can do this and hear some different ways on how you can kind of do it your own way. I love that. That's, that's, that's so key right there. What you just said, I did a YouTube video myself and trying my hand at it. And, (laughs) and I just did it on like presentations and like how important it is to show your work, you know, and I was reading a book and I'm not sure if you, if you have the same book, because I feel like you just said exactly what the book is all about, which is like, stop gatekeeping, you know, just tell everyone about what you're doing, share it with everyone. Why, why gatekeep? Why, why do that? You know, it doesn't help anyone. (laughs) Yeah. And I don't think that's like, I wasn't trying to be negative in saying that my school, you know, gatekeeps. but I think it's just the nature. It's like a very competitive field. It's art. It's this kind of form where everyone's trying to compete to be the best in school. So I just, I just wanted to make it more accessible to everyone. And I think, you know, like piggybacking off that, a lot of the content you would find on YouTube is mostly architecture based. I know Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from, you know, watching some of the creators on architecture, but it doesn't all apply to us. Mm -hmm. Um, So I wanted to kind of, I guess, take the role of being that person to show everyone what the world of landscape architecture is all about. And I feel like no one, even architects don't really even know what the world looks like, what that is, which is insane. It's not good. (laughs) It's not good. (laughs) It's not good at all. Like, and it's hard because like, I think too, when I started in school, I was like, architects, those guys, blah, 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 blah. And then as I graduated, it's more of like a, I wish you knew, you know, I wish you knew what it was yeah. um, because it is really cool. And uh, we have a studio where we had architecture students and right. landscape students. And I loved that studio. I mean, for me, other students had issues, but my partner was the best. Anna <laughs> Vasquez, shout out to you, girl. You're the best. And it was just so cool to talk to somebody that understood their world so well. I understood my world really well. And we worked really well together and we were able to create a really neat project. but. I think that your videos are are talking to a wide array of people. And you even mentioned to me that even people outside of the industry are reaching out to you, right? Right. Yeah. So I think there's that there's that side of it. And then the kind of last goal in mind was just to basically create more of a network for landscape architecture and more of a place to come learn about landscape architecture. I think social media is so important, especially with younger generations on like just learning about what you might be interested in. So having some representation in terms of social media for landscape architecture, what it is, I think the more people that know about it, the better our field can grow and develop. I have my tutorial side and then there's also more theory conceptual side of the channel where we just kind of talk broadly about different subjects just so that people are more aware of it. Because as you know, there's so much in the kind of realm of landscape architecture that just goes beyond what people think of just picking out trees or like mowing the lawn, you know? So there's just so much (laughs) layers in landscape architecture. So I think it's just such a great field because you can always be learning something new. You might not be learning something new about design. You might be learning something new about ecology or people or cultures. And I think all of those things are really valuable to make you a a better designer. But I think knowing about landscape architecture potentially could make you just a better, more well-rounded human as well. Ooh, profound, profound. (laughs) (laughs) Just a a better human. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah, I just think like, you have to be a well-rounded person to be a landscape architect and to to really design for everyone. So I think it just makes you a better person just for for knowing more about this field. Yeah, because you're right. You have to do a lot of research on people, cultures, on 
ecology and the way that the land and nature functions, you know, that is so important. I totally, yeah, I think that's a a fair statement. (laughs) (laughs) And like, so you said something, actually, I want to go back to because it kind of piqued my curiosity. You said that you made these YouTube videos to as your creative outlet in school. Yeah. So I think I would say I used it more of a creative outlet post-grad, but I think Mm -hmm. it was more of a expression of just what I was interested in in school rather than you kind of have to choose a project and you go in a certain direction and you have to make these things that look really nice. Whereas this was kind of just more of a, for fun, let's try a bunch of different things that we probably wouldn't put, you know, in a portfolio or something and, and just give back to the like community that I've been learning about. So that's so neat. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also people are not tip typically like a person is not going to take the time out of their busy schedule to do content creation or YouTube or things like that. So it takes an immense, again, of consistency and discipline, which do you feel like you learned? Like, are you just, (laughs) there has been so many, like two steps forward, like three steps back scenarios of just like, I mean, the whole content creation, social round, like just being prepared for all that is, was a whole learning curve that I, I think like I'm still learning about now. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's the same thing with me too, is trying to understand how that world works. One thing that I always felt is just totally against everyone is the algorithm. You know, why are you against me? You know, it's like, I'm trying to create content. You're just, and it's you're just hoping it likes you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, please like me. Yeah, please, please <laughs> like me. Like, how can I nurse you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. But, yeah, on that note of like consistency and stuff, I think like time management and all those things you just have to be really good at just to be able to manage a, you know, full time job that in our field is often more than 40 hours, as you know. So just finding like my own schedule and what works for me to be able to create things, which I think is natural in terms of like creator i think creators being tied down to like a nine to five is kind of tough which yeah. opens up i know a whole new can of worms for a conversation but mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. I, it's just really hard to find your creative window it might not be in that nine to five time frame so i yeah. for me i i have a lot of creativity like early in the morning or later at night and that's tends to be when i am creating things Nice. And when you say creating things, like what, what specifically? It's just like idea brainstorming for different like videos or, or research on different topics that you could talk about. It could just be playing around with drawings or looking at different things that might be interesting to tell people about. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess like creativity really does have multiple different ways of rearing itself, you know, especially with doing videos and stuff like that. And I think that does require a level of like a certain level of creativity and organization that you have to create things that you, not only you, but then then it's also kind of doing this balancing act of trying to do videos for other people too. I would say like the last few months has been a, like a huge realization of just of making sure that I'm still doing things that I am enjoying and, Mm-hmm. So that the content is still better and yep. it's putting all, putting all of my effort into it and trying to find the right balance. Everyone talks about the dream of quitting that nine to five and just <laughs> doing everything, you know, and it's just like, how realistic is that? You know, because you have to, in some sense, like you have to do something and hope that people like it <laughs> so that right. you could do, do it more and then possibly get paid for it. You know, yeah. <laughs> that would be even better. Yeah. And you might end up spending a lot more time than your nine to five to try and yes. make something like that work. Yes, well. exactly. Exactly. And it takes time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. How long has it been since you started the channel? So I created probably my first video, I think the summer after I graduated, so that'd be 2021. And then I didn't post for like eight months after that. <laughs> and then <laughs> I think I started up again in the, yeah, I think 20, probably spring of 2022. And then I've been pretty, I would say pretty consistent since 2022. So about probably a year, year and a half now of like consistent, actually dedicated to 
the channel and, and growing it and, and all that. Do you feel like you learned anything within that eight month period of not creating videos? And what kind of sparked that? I'm going to do it and I'm going to commit to this. Yeah. Well, I think honestly, I, I kind of let go of it because I think the shock of working full time Mm -hmm. and just readjusting to life after college was a lot. I just didn't have time for it really. And then was able to kind of ground myself and come back to it a little bit later with a little bit better of idea of what I wanted to do mm. and just a little bit better of a setup. So I think over those like seven, eight months, however long it was, was really just more of game planning in my head of how I saw the channel and what I kind of wanted the the channel to be and represent. Mm. And then like finally getting back into it when I felt that I was able to give time back to to that wow that's that's awesome that you're able to like commit to it and just go you know headlong on that and and stick to it so i'm curious i'm more curious so (laughs) let's rewind back to when you found out about landscape architecture like where what at what point in your life did you find out about this you even know existed you know um (laughs) so I think like to go way back, I've always been like very enamored with the landscape and just mm-hmm. like, I love to hike. I love to be outdoors. Just, I just love to be immer- immersed in nature. And then there was also the side of me that really, really liked knowing how things were put together. Like I, for whatever reason, I like binge watched how it's made when I was probably like seven years old. So I just really liked how, like knowing how things were built. I also like always played with Legos or whatever when I was little and just liked building things using my hands. So I think yeah, that's like my very early background. But then as I grew up, I kind of thought I always wanted to be an engineer. So I actually went to school first for mechanical and civil engineering. And then while I was at school, with different school, I had to go to these lecture series as part of the requirement for the class. And I went to this lecture by a landscape architect, Matthew Cunningham, who is like a really awesome landscape, residential landscape designer up in Massachusetts. And he gave like this just awesome presentation speech that I was like, this is awesome. I want to do this. This seems like the perfect marriage of like my creative side with the kind of more mechanical, like structured side, because I think for me, I never, I never was like an art kid. Like I didn't really take art classes. I was never an artist. I still am working on trying to draw better. (laughs) Yeah, I always had this creative side and I just always felt like while I was in school for engineering that I just wouldn't be fulfilled because I always had this creative side. And I think once I discovered what landscape architecture was, that I really just took it and and ran with it. And then I switched majors sophomore year and then the rest is history. <laughs> wow. And here you are. Here wow. I am. That's, that's one thing I didn't realize about landscape architecture is that there is a side for the left brainers, you know, like, it's not just right brain creative, you know, yeah. like plants and stuff. Like there is totally, totally a space and room for people who do mechanical things, like people who like the details, like people yeah. who do that. I think that's the question I get asked most often on my channel is people are really interested in landscape architecture and they, they really want to do it, but they always ask, I'm terrible at drawing. I can't draw. I don't think I can survive this. And I always just tell them that you have four years to learn and build your craft. You d- you don't need to be perfect at drawing when you get there. Yes, there will be people there when you show up who are awesome yeah. at everything and you will feel <laughs> the struggle, but just yeah. keep at it and you will catch up because you just have four years to to kind of create that craft, five for some schools. And then yeah. on top of that, it's just a different type of drawing. I mean, it's not, it's not the traditional art in a way it can be the drawing style in landscape architecture is, is different and there's ways to make more mechanically than others. Mm -hmm. So I just, I always tell people um, that just don't worry about it, just go into it and just 
try your best. Yes. And I always tell people this, when I got into school, I had to draw. I was the same exact way. I was, no, I'm not drawing. There's no way. <laughs> yeah. but, oh, in order to get into school, you have to draw. And I'm like, right. oh. So I, I committed to that. I, I went on YouTube and I went on this, I learned from this one guy. I don't remember his name, but man, he was amazing. And after that week of me drawing and drawing, 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 learning from his videos, I ended up submitting those drawings and getting accepted because yeah. I just, you, you, you can do it. You know, it's just it takes time and effort and, and energy and, and drawing is, you know, that's one aspect of it. You know? Right. Exactly. That's a whole yeah. other, yeah. Whole other. It's just, it's just like, all you're doing is just trying to develop sort of a, a mindset when right. you're drawing. You're trying to develop some sort of lens to view the world. Not so much just I see it with my eyes, the more detailed yeah. internalizing of it. Yeah, that's kind of what I use it for. I think, yeah. I don't know, technology has come so far that we don't really rely on hand drawings for a lot of those like high-end renderings at this point. So sketching is really just like idea mm -hmm. dumping and just... Yep. putting your ideas out in the paper and you probably don't even show a lot of people them. You're just kind of brainstorming. So that's a whole other thing to not be scared of as well. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Especially when you're doing content creation and you're yeah. putting out your stuff <laughs> and you're like, Oh my gosh, this is <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, you do really cool stuff. I really, I mean, I mean, you posted some, right? Or you've done, like you've sketched with the app Morfolio, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you've done some really cool, cool, really cool sketches. I think people can learn from. Yeah. yeah. And so when you were in high school, did you yeah. go in thinking, I'm going to be a civil engineer, you know, or were you kind of lost in what to do? I think I was like 70, 30, because I applied for some schools for architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of the schools I applied to were for like mechanical engineering. And for whatever reason, I always thought I would end up like working for like a car industry, doing like concept things for engineering for them. Oh. So I don't know. I think I was just kind of set on that. I also like come from a heavy engineering family. So I think that mm. was like not all I knew, but something I knew that worked and like I would have a great network for how to like have a really? successful career as an engineer. But then once I got into it, the first couple of months out of out of school, I was like a little culture shock of like, is this really what I want to do? And then like, I yeah. felt like after a couple of months, I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that moment like? Like, were you like sketching something or doing a cool project? Uh, it actually was when I saw my first project completed and was mm -hmm. on the site after like we went through lots of different deadlines and lots of construction, like administration stuff, just seeing the project come together and like just stepping foot on there and seeing the ribbon cutting and seeing all the people enjoying the space. I was like, yeah, this is, That's this so is neat. what all the work is for. <laughs> that is so neat. Wow. That's a really good feeling when you work so hard on something and you're in the process and then you look back and you can say, wow. Yeah. Cause so I, as you know, like you don't get that, that side of it in school, like you do all these really cool drawings. Sometimes you help out different communities. Like I know my, my school, you did a lot of projects for different, different people and they kind of went whatever direction they wanted to go with mm -hmm. from the information they gathered. But this was the first time where you did something and you got to see the like raw reactions from people in the space, which is always something I've been really kind of in love with in terms of landscape architecture is just the impact you can make on like a greater community. Mm, that's, that's wonderful. And the fact that you even have a hand in that, I feel like it's kind of hard not to, you know, do that within the field of landscape architecture, not to say that there's, I mean, there's parking lot jobs, there's parking yeah. lot <laughs> projects that I've worked on myself. Hey, you're helping you know? people park. <laughs> Necessary, you know, you know but <laughs> it's just like, okay like not cool but right. you know you don't see like the impact it makes on people like you don't get to see like wow people walking in a park and be like oh, you know the eyes exactly. of yeah. like the wonder the excitement the like exploration and and all that there is joy in that and I think that that yeah and that's kind of a perfect segue into the into that question of just like 
the journey, the process, like what makes it all worth it? And would you say it is just improving communities and, and all that? I mean, going yeah. through how long you went, you went to four years of, of landscape? Four years of school. Yeah. Four years and got, got your bachelor's. Yeah. Okay. So now yeah. you're three years and I know. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, I, I just think to your point, to your question that just knowing that you might have impacted one person and made their day a little bit better. You made a space more enjoyable for that one person to come to every day is really what drives it for me. That's really kind of the biggest driver for my content as well. Just knowing that I helped one person with their decision to go into the field or not to go into the field or Mm. to help them out for their, their project that they've been stressing out for, you know, who knows how long I just think being able to impact people and give back to communities and and just people along the way of what I know, because what I know might, you know, you can take it with a grain of salt, but at least you're hearing someone else's perspective and it helps either inform you that you're doing the right thing, or maybe you're not doing the right thing. And you either go in whatever direction you feel is best for you. So those are kind of right. what drives me and keeps me coming back. Yeah. And being in college, being in a four-year, I was in a five-year program and that was, <laughs> yeah. I mean, at this point I deserve a doctorate because I was in like a year and a half of community yeah. college. And then I started my five-year program with like high schoolers and I love them. I mean, they're, they're great. They're, you know, they were great people, but it was just like, it was like, oh my gosh, after seven years of school, it's like, yeah. Oh. But <laughs> I, yeah, like, I think I need to stop going to school. I think that's right. the, the actual lesson. Learned. But now after school and everything, looking back, what would you wish you had learned in school that I guess you maybe, maybe didn't prepare you for the real world or you wish had prepared you for the real world? Like, is there Ooh. anything you thought of that? Yeah, I just think up front before I give the reason, I guess. I think it's so hard to prepare you for all the aspects of landscape architecture because it is so broad. Yeah. But I just think for me, just understanding some of the end goals and how to manage and deal with some clients and mm-hmm. kind of the back end stuff of pro bono and, and the business side mm-hmm. of things, I think would be really interesting to know because I think it helps you mm-hmm. understand some of the end processes and what you're working towards. Mm-hmm. And then there's like the whole in field knowledge that I, I just don't know how you would teach it. Honestly, you just need to hire a project manager to teach your studio for a year or something. But like that whole knowledge of just being able to understand what you're drawing and, and the like realization that every little line you make on a CAD drawing is going to be built one way or the other. So I think just Mm. realizing that is something that I didn't know about because you kind of just loosey goosey draw stuff in school just to make it look nice oftentimes. And then you get into the profession and you're like, no, no, this needs to be like perfect offsets. Like there's just, you need to do this a specific way or it will cause a lot of problems. You just said a trauma word for me. (laughs) Perfect offset. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Oh my God. (laughs) But you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's, it's a whole other side of the field that you just, I think it's just really hard to teach in school because in school, I do think it's good that you kind of learn about just kind of overarching concepts and, and just design testing rather than having to be introduced to all those other realities mm. that happen in the space. I think it's just a really hard balance to manage. It is. And and it's hard because when you try to brainstorm like, oh, how could the schools prepare you better for the work life or workforce? But in reality, it's a very difficult line. It's a very, it's very difficult to do because you're not on the ground. You're not dealing with real world problems that could affect right. budgets, you know, that affect clients, that affect the business, the branding, you know, a lot is at stake when when you work at a firm versus at school you're just trying to make the deadline like that's all you care about yeah you know <laughs> so it's just totally different world and it's, it's yeah it's hard it's hard to 
to figure out what the solution could be. But the business side, I think is, I think you're, yeah, totally right. I wish I had known that too. The business side of landscape architecture. Because like, I would have like, no idea how, like if I wanted to open up my own firm, I would have no idea how to do that. Yes. <laughs> you know? And I feel like you should have at least a general sense of like what direction mm-hmm. you should go in. Obviously you can reach out to people or maybe your own firm or other people who have just started firms or, or something like that. But I, I would have just no idea how to, how to do that in, 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 yes. in today's world. <laughs> oh my gosh. You're totally right. When I was at, you know, my firm, it was just, and a few firms, like I work for just a like, couple of them. And it was just like, the business, the way that they run business almost kind of seems like hush hush, you know, at times like, yeah. it's kind of like, well, you just, you just do the production, you know, and we'll carry, we'll worry about that other stuff. And I'm like, I don't know what that is, you know, it's just because it, it is a business. Like, I think that's one thing I did not think about when I came out of school. Right. It's a business. Like. Yeah, they're doing art and 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 cool illustrative <laughs> and like details, but right. it's like it's a business. <laughs> they have to survive, you know, in this climate. Do you ever think that you could see yourself owning your own business, or do you feel okay? I'm happy. Well, I guess because now you're you're in the process, right? You're you're still fresh in the industry. Would you ever see yourself starting your own thing? Yeah. I don't know. My dream obviously is to be able to do the whole content thing full time. I would love Mm. to, I don't know. There's a side of me that would like to get into teaching because that's kind of already what I sort of do. Yeah. Uh, So I could see, I don't know. I'm at like this weird point where I could see myself going in a bunch of different directions. I could see myself like going all in on the content thing, if it, you know, grew to a point Mm -hmm. where I felt that it could be something and then maybe supplement that with like some work that I do on the side for people. I could also see just kind of moving up the corporate ladder, I guess. I think that's the least interesting. And then there's the whole (laughs) other side of maybe go back to school, become a teacher and, and do something a little bit more formal than what I do on, you know, my channel. And and work for a, a school or university and just yeah. increase the knowledge and give back to the field. That's so neat. What would you teach on like specifically? Um, I think I would, um, that's a good question. <laughs> I like modeling the most. So I feel like if I could do a class on mm-hmm. like just modeling would be really fun, but I think the, grading and all those things I'm good at the math based stuff I think I'd be a good teacher at teaching people how to grade and do swales and all that other important stuff that is boring to everyone but is kind of exciting to me (laughs) (laughs) but then yeah either that or modeling honestly are the two things I really like but I would love to just like paint back or just peel back the layers of like if I could do a class on just the professional world or or things like that just real life expectations in the field, I think would be really fun too. Yes. Yes. And, and I think that's where YouTube kind of gives you that opportunity in a way, Yeah, you know, some small, you know, well, actually, I mean, influence like you're, that's like the, the key word, right. Is like, you're, be, you're, you're able to have sort of an influence and, and, yeah. and talk about those things. Yeah. Influencer is like a trigger word. Cause I hate, I, I, like, I was at Labash and a bunch of people like, Oh my God, you're like a landscape architect influencer. And I was like, no, don't no, I'm just a landscape architect. <laughs> That's so funny. I know. And influencer is kind of like a weird word because it almost yeah. makes you sound like celebrity. Yeah. I'm like, and, I'm not, I'm just yeah. a regular dude that yeah. like, just likes to give back and tell people yeah. about what's going on like that's it <laughs> I'm not trying to be famous <laughs> <laughs> yep 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 but that's great that you're already coming at it with this humility of just I'm just here helping people and yeah, I just and that's, that's all I want to do that's just the goal I mean I don't yeah. I just want to help people in any way that I can because I, yeah. I feel like I've was someone always looking for help going through school on just how to be mm. better at certain things because I always felt behind in a way coming from not an art background or Mm -hmm. something like that so I just I know people are in the same shoes as I was in school so knowing that I can just help them out at all is what drives me yeah that's I think coming from personal like that personal background of just like you said wanting to help yourself and then being able to offer that to people 
what would be your advice to somebody who is struggling to transition into like the landscape architecture um, environment, let's say at school, not so much at work, um, but they're just, because I'm the same way. Like I came from like, I think I, I changed my major four times. You know, I didn't even know what the heck I was doing. So what would be your advice? <laughs> I mean, I would just say like, just don't be so hard on yourself and let, let yourself grow into the person that you want to become. It's not going to be an overnight thing and you just have to keep at it and just also know your personal boundaries. You don't need to spend every night, every moment in studio to get better. You can grow outside of the studio, not working on projects, take some time to kind of ground yourself, come back, like do some drawing, spend a couple hours, leave, go somewhere else, Yeah. come back, regroup, and you'll find that you are growing a little, at least for me, I found mm -hmm. that by going away, doing something else, taking my mind off of it and coming back, I was able to be better and grow faster instead of like the kind of creative block that you end up just trying to work through and you just get frustrated. And yeah. I just think take breaks, enjoy your time there and just don't rush and let yourself grow into the person that you want to become. Right. Yeah. That's, that's huge is just kind of stepping away from that because I think like, you know, when you're doing these projects, you're over overloading your brain yeah. with ideas. It's just, it's overwhelming. And and I remember being up until six in the morning sometimes, yeah. you know, it's just common. But the thing is that you should like what you do because then it's like, Certainly. I would rather be six. I would rather, I would rather be up at 6 a.m. getting a good project done versus not. Yeah, definitely. But yeah. But staying at like walking away, just kind of letting your brain just, yeah, just go take a breather. <laughs> Yeah, I just I like I think back to like sophomore year when we first started doing studios and just like seeing our class be just so overwhelmed with what's mm -hmm. going on in the whole studio process because I still can remember like the first studio and just the workload that you just don't know how to manage and just freaking out about it. <laughs> oh yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, like gosh. it does get better if you're just starting school and you're listening. It, yeah. You just started. That's yeah, better. You guys You're going to gonna be okay. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get through it. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is kind of, I remember like, I remember when my mom was home, like I would be in the kitchen coming from school or like, or just working out because this has happened multiple times, working on a project and I'll just bust out of my room and I'm like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> you know, just, I can't do this. You know, it's just, my mom always telling me like, you can do anything you set your mind to gonna be okay yeah. <laughs> you know so I think it's just it's just such a good advice to like this it's okay you know you're gonna get through it and you learn a lot you know through that process and for you I guess like oh, yeah. what things what things did prepare you for the real world in school well I think the the teaching of like the design process I think my school did a really good job of just Mm -hmm. emulating the real world process of how you take, you know, your basic concept ideas throughout like a kind of more of a final project. But I would say like, honestly, that takes you through like the schematic design phase in the real world, but that's like yeah. kind of everything. I mean, once you it know is. that process, mm -hmm. you kind of just repeat, repeat it at a more refined version in the next stages, honestly. But I think that prepared me really well. Just the like general organization and like time management skills that you have to develop in order to survive at the school yeah, really help prepare you for what you are going to be doing in the real world and how to just manage deadlines and, and those things. Mm -hmm. um, how to communicate, how to tell your ideas, how to do it in ways that's, you know, verbally and also just on the paper, like all those things are super important that you learn in school that apply every day for, for the real world. Yeah, totally. I think, you know, there's always going to be something that we're going to have to take from the theory part and apply it into the real yeah. world at some point, you know, but for you, when you were transitioning into the real world and you were just trying to navigate that you know how was that process for you like was it difficult was it you know 
new and exciting or was it just like, how was it? You know, cause no one knows how the role was going to look like until you like step into the, your foot, your foot into the office, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think I had like, I guess probably an incredibly skewed view of how the transition process went. Cause I was hired in the middle of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So my first four months was like remotely full time, which I think is an incredibly hard oh, learning environment to gosh. learn how to navigate full time job at home remote? remotely and learn all remote? that. Oh my yeah. gosh, my gosh, full time. So that's oh. a little bit skewed, but I think the like main challenge was just figuring out how to like have time back for myself. I think the nine to five is an interesting topic because it's not really just nine to five. It's, you know, the time that you processing it before you go in, it's the time you're deloading after. Right. So just, I think the overall feeling of being like you're tied down for a set amount of time, whereas school, you kind of had like some classes, you might have an hour class here, an hour class there, a three hour studio, and you basically just got the work done when you had to. I think the change from getting it done to get it done and having to do stuff from this time period was probably the most challenging thing that I went through. Mm. And then honestly, just it's, I think probably personal, but just getting used to like just sitting in an office for 40, 50 hours a week was like just a a big thing to get used to. Cause I I like a very mobile person always moving Mm. around. So just, that was another challenge as well. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It, <laughs> uh, I, I, I get that. Problems. Yeah. Right. It's like, just get used to getting a salary, you know, yeah. <laughs> but it's so true. I mean, you just get used to five years or four years of whatever the heck survive basically. And yeah. then you do structured nine to five, you know, and it's like, now you have the incentive to work because you are making a salary. So it's right. okay. I need my benefits. I need my dental. I need my, you know, all that yeah, stuff. Exactly. And I like what I, I like what I do, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, it's, it is a transition and it's, it's yeah. not. And I think like, yeah. I think a year, a, a year removed, the other realization is in school, as you're growing up, there's a lot of change. There's always change every year. The people you meet might be changing. Mm-hmm. You're changing schools. You're going on to new places. When you go to mm-hmm. college, you're like, okay, I'll be doing this for four years and then I'll go do something else. And mm-hmm. one for me, I got to about a year, year and a half removed from school. And I was like, oh, this is what I'm, this is like the next 40 years. Yeah. And the change yeah. goes from like rapid change all the time to a very steady thing that sort of you lose time with. I mean, I feel like mm. A, that was still COVID. So I feel like COVID time just didn't exist for me. And then it's very easy, I think, when you're working nine to five, maybe a year removed to just feel like every day is the same and you're just kind of going through the motions at some point. Even as like creative of a field as we're in, I think sometimes you just fall into a pattern. I think I just wasn't prepared for for that aspect either. Yeah. And you're not alone. You know, it is, it is definitely. A challenge, but you come out of the other side of that, you know. Right. So it, that's your proof that it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do think like there's waves. <laughs> at least for me, I go through a lot of waves. I think naturally, I don't know if it's a creative person thing, but like I burn out like yeah. super fast on something. So like I go through like periods of disinterest and in like the the daily motions and then I I'm super passionate again and then it just like waves of mm. and I think that's just a creative thing that happens at yeah. least for me <laughs> yeah that sounds about right I mean I think that because because like you know when you're in the when you're in the profession like you're it's it's not it is your life in a way but it's not you know it's like it's yeah so there's things about it that, you know, don't change. And, and then you go to work every day doing the same thing, but you're also dealing with life. Like you're, you're doing right. life at the same time of working. 
So whatever inspires you outside of work might, might fuel your passion, right? For work. But then sometimes right. it doesn't. You have a really tough day and then you're just like, I hate landscape architecture today. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, it's that you're right. So would you say now three years in, where would you say you are in sort of like the experience spectrum? Like you're still early um, or. Yeah. It's a really hard question. I feel like I can finally apply for the, for every job that is three to five years. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I feel like every job yeah. out of college is three to five years for yeah. no reason. Entry level, by the way. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Entry level, three to five years. So, like, it's cool that I've reached the the threshold of like I could probably just apply to anywhere because I have enough experience. I think I don't know. I think everyone's like first couple of years is so different. It's hard to gauge where you're at. Like, I know I was at a really small firm. I had my hands on all aspects of the project. So, in a sense, I feel like I'm ahead of a lot of people who went to a really large firm and a really great firm in most cases, but really only spent their time, you know, modeling or they spent their time in CAD or yep. in concepts. Whereas I learned a lot about everything where mm. I think that sets me up a little bit better in terms of like moving towards maybe like more of an associate level than others. Mm. So I just think it's like a hard a hard place to put myself because I, obviously I don't know where everyone else is at. I can only speak yeah. for what I know and how I feel about myself. So I, I do feel like I have enough experience where I could walk in and fill, you know, any role at this point. I don't like when I started my new job, I didn't feel the same pressure and Oh crap, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I mm -hmm. felt with my first job, but there's just, there's just still so much that yeah. I need to learn about that yeah that is yeah. happening too what are you kind of looking forward to learning you know now I think just honing in on like my skills and just being better at representing what I'm drawing and making sure that mm -hmm. what I'm drawing is actually buildable I think yeah. is something that is always a struggle. I know I've talked with like principals about that kind of concept and that's something that you're always learning about. So I think there's that side. There's the whole administration planting knowledge that I'm really yeah. interested in picking out products, picking out the right products, how to plant better, what types work here, what types don't work here. So it's all like that secondary knowledge that I'm finding interest in now. Mm. Yeah. And that's really neat that you're at the point where you're just like, okay, I've passed this thresh threshold. <laughs> I can start learning other things now. And um, that's also shows consistency as well. It's just like sticking to something, continuing yeah. to grow in spite of how you feel some days too. Right. Yeah. Cause I think like the first, the first year you are like really just learning on how the project like timelines work I know like my first project I went through from like schematic design all the way through construction administration was really valuable for me to be a part of just because I was able to then go on to the next project and understand what is worth doing in schematic design and what's not worth doing in schematic design and mm -hmm. some of the other phases just because like once I had a better understanding of what the end result is supposed to be and how to get there I was able to like better prepare myself during the earlier stages. So I didn't have to spend as much time mm -hmm. later on going back and fixing things. Right. So mm -hmm. that was, is a whole other side of landscape architecture that I think you learn about. And I think just going through your first project right out of school is very intense with the mm -hmm. deadlines and some of the pushes that happen. Yeah. But once you see and go through like two or three of those, you then are able to, I think, have more time back to look at other things that you're interested in because you're not freaking out and just trying to yeah. keep up with the pace that's really rapid in our field. Right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And when you were starting to look for a firm, did you, did you have an idea of what you wanted to work on, like as far as projects go, what you wanted to learn? I knew I wanted to be in public realm. I knew I didn't want to do like private gardens. Because mm -hmm. again, my interest is like the impact on a larger group rather oh, than, yeah. you know, 
doing really high end residential. So I knew I wanted to be in the public realm, but I, I don't know if I had like some firms in mind that I think are like the dream big firms. Like, you know, I wanted to work for Sasaki or OJB or, you know, you know, the big, you know, firms that everyone wants to work for MVVA. But I think I made the choice that I pretty much wanted to work for those firms that I talked about, the really big firms. Right. And then as I was kind of going through and applying and talking to people about where I really should end up, one of my professors who, you know, I ended up working for was like, you should go small first and you should learn Mm. all about everything and then take your skills that you learned over however long you want to be there. Or maybe you want to, maybe you love it. You don't want to leave, but most likely nobody ever stays at their first job. So yeah. take your knowledge and then bring it to where you want to go mm. because you'll have just so much more knowledge. And that's kind of the route I went with my, my firm progression and I wouldn't change it at all. That's super smart. I think I had, I wish I had someone tell me that like, yeah, your first firm is not going to be, you know, the first one you stay at. And right. one thing I didn't know, I don't know if you knew this, but like, it's actually quite common for people to like, hop around different firms for a while, like three or four firms. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just like, it's really hard going through the interview process to kind of gauge what, what the firm's all about. You know, they might do really cool work, but you might hate working there. Mm -hmm. It might be people you don't want to be with, or maybe it's just unreasonable for you to, to manage that. Right. Yeah. And there's also just every firm does different projects in a different way. And Yes. I think you really kind of have to fit into a team. It's not really about fitting into the firm. It's more of like, do you get along with that team? Do you do you want to put in the time for your for your teammates and your colleagues? So right. I I think it's it's definitely valid to kind of hop around and find something that yeah. that you really like and find your your place and then put your all into that. I, I think it's just it's really hard. I mean. There's yeah. so many different firms. There's so many different types of designs and places that you can go yeah. into within the field that totally. And then just college in general. I mean, it's really hard to know what you want to do. It so it is, yeah. At, you know, 18 years old, you're told, you know, pick something out and do it for until you're 70. So yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh my god. I, I always talk about this all the time in our side talks. It was just like why do they instill in you at such a young age? Like, yeah, you're, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? And you're like, I'm, I'm 10. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I have no rational thoughts. At the yeah. No. Like literally <laughs> my brain's not developed, you know, <laughs> it's not even fully developed guys. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's okay to take time, you know? Yeah. I think that's, I think it's also something that's really hard. I think for people post-grad, like in your twenties, yeah. it's just feeling like the pressure of, I need to have my whole life figured out. I need to be making yes. X amount of money. I need yes. to be on my own. I need to do all this. And like, yeah, it's great if you're fortunate enough to know what you want. Like I, I believe I was fortunate enough to know my path pretty early on and it stuck through and like, I really enjoyed it, but there's tons of people that I know. I have a bunch of friends who just, it's really hard. I mean, mm. so I just think your twenties should be more exploratory and I wish people would recognize that I like got a lot of the older folks would, you know, come on board and recognize that knowing what you want to do in your twenties is really hard. Yes. And yeah. just take the time to figure it out. And if you don't need to, you don't owe anyone anything mm. uh, in terms of like the workforce. I mean, yeah, give your all when you're there, but yeah. if it's not what you want, if it's, if your passions are somewhere else, go in that direction. Definitely the mindset shift that I've had in the last year of just like do things for me, you know, Mm. it's about me first. And then, then the other pieces will fall in line once you figure out yourself. And you have to take the time to ask yourself what, what you like, who you are, you know, like, what is it that you like? That's a hard question. It is. It is. And you, and, and sometimes like you have to talk to people because you realize that this is actually more common than you think. Exactly. I think you can talk to anyone and they'll, 
they'll be in the same spot as you. Exactly. Even like someone who on the surface thinks or appears like they have it all together. I mean, they're still most likely going through, you know, what, what they want to be doing as well. So. Yeah. And that they're trying to navigate that too. Yeah. It's just a, a real world is incredibly hard to navigate and it's yeah. just, it's overwhelming when you first come out. It is, it is, but you're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that sometimes too, it's just like, it can sound depressing, but in a lot of ways, it's exciting. Like I remember, it is. yeah. Like I remember when people telling me that they're just like, well, I'm so excited for you. And you're like, Thank you. You know, it's just it's hard to I don't feel that way at the moment. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, that that means like you're not worried about me, which is <laughs> which yeah. is like a way better place to be. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This was this was great. Really, really enjoyed talking to you and and just getting your thoughts on yeah, what it's like to be a new professional slash experienced professional and and trying to navigate this world. I have one last question for you, and it's. Yeah probably the most hated question ever, (laughs) but what do you think landscape architecture is? I guess the definition that I usually tell people who don't know what landscape architecture is, Mm -hmm. is landscape architecture is everything that a building is not. So anything that you see, interact with, look at, have any sort of thought about at all that lives outside of a structure or a building that is the realm of possibility for landscape architects. So anything you see is most likely designed by a landscape architect. That's not the architecture. So I think there's a lot of stereotypes of landscape architecture, as you know. So Mm -hmm. when I tell people that it kind of gives people, oh, you guys do this too? Yes, we we do it all. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's my single, it's so hard. I mean, it's, it's so... It's so yeah. diverse of a subject, but I think that's the easiest way to describe it for me. Yeah. And that's the exactly the way that I describe it too, is that it's anything in between a building. Yeah. You know? And it's just because I feel like you just can't pigeonhole it. You can't just be like, well, it's this and that. It's some I, Well, you can. Actually, some people do view it a very specific way, but really like at the end of the day, it's like anything in between a building. And then people are like, oh, okay. And then so, they're like, oh, so you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're like, yeah. so you do, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, this was great. Thanks so much, Carter. I really appreciate it. Enjoyed, enjoyed talking to you. And and I'm really excited for this for students or young professionals or anyone else who listens to this to be able to learn from you and, and learn from what you do and from your videos and, and all that. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was a really fun conversation and I hope everyone enjoys listening. Yay. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to this enlightening episode of the Greenside Podcast. We hope you enjoyed gaining insights into the world of landscape architecture and the incredible work of Carter, aka Design at Green. If you found this episode as inspiring as I did, don't keep it to yourself. Share this episode with your friends, family, and anyone who appreciates the beauty of our outdoor spaces. Together, let's spread the knowledge and passion for landscape architecture far and wide. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Greenside Podcast on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. And if you're feeling extra generous, leave us a review. Your feedback helps us continue to bring you engaging content and fascinating guests. Are you a landscape architecture enthusiast, a student eager to learn, or a professional looking to connect with like-minded individuals? Join our community by following us on social media. You can find us on Instagram at the Greenside Podcast. Until next time, keep exploring, keep designing, and keep dreaming. Goodbye for now.